There you go. That's a little bit of a refresher on last year's standing for you. I uh, moved in that video way back when in the 2014 World Championships. But uh, last year's standing format, obviously, you're very familiar with Firebat. Mm -hmm. But it really does create uh, a more pick and pick orientated and pick and ban orientated tactic, and just allows for a little bit more strategy in how you line up your decks. Yeah, definitely. I think it does. So there's way more things that you have to consider, and you have to try and sort of leverage your lineup to make sure that you can't get 3 0'd and uh, predict your opponent's ban so that you can make a ban that sort of counteracts your opponent, which comes into a little bit of the mind games here. And we've seen a lot of series so far in this tournament where players have uh, been like sweeped by Paladin, for example, as their counter to Paladin gets banned and they don't see that coming in the future. So they don't have another deck to counter Paladin and they didn't think to ban Paladin there. So that's been a common trend that's been happening this tournament. Yeah, I know. It, obviously, a lot of players are maybe not as... Uh familiar with last year's standing or, or maybe a little bit rusty on how last year's standing works from what we've seen but you can avoid that and that is the criticism of last year's standing that strong decks can just steamroll you 3-0 and if there is one particularly strong deck that beats everything that is that is you know traditionally the case but you can avoid against that because instead of conquest where both players are potentially picking a new deck every game one player has to stick with the same deck so knowing what your opponent is going to play in the next game gives you a, a great advantage in picking your lineup yeah so it usually makes the series just go like one player gets the first win and that win is sort of up in the air because you don't know what your opponent's going to play and then the other player has the ability to pick the counter deck to that in their lineup if they have it available to them and then they sort of trade matches back and forth which comes down to the last game and then you can see really the difference when it's two to two who has the advantage in the last game, whose lineup was stronger there against the opponent. So it's pretty interesting to see. I like it a lot more than Conquest personally, but uh, each line, each uh, format has its merits. It does provide a lot more opportunities for us as uh, analysts as well, I think, mm -hmm. to be able to really uh, analyze the way a series is going. Looking back at the, the 6 ORDU series, for example, where the aggro druid mirror in game four was in a lot of ways the, the deciding game because if RDU had managed to win with that, he probably would have managed to beat six as Freeze Mage. And that was really the turning point rather than it just being back and forth with every, with three players bringing, with it, both players bringing the three objectively strongest decks. And it's, uh, I guess, a coin flip on how you line them up or just whoever plays them better or whoever draws better. Yeah, definitely a lot more opportunities for the lineup to matter. So it's going to be exciting to see. Do we have the lineups actually here for Two Beers and Strife Girl coming up? We do. We do. We can uh, have a look at those. So we have from Strife Girl the Paladin, Hunter, and Mage with his Warrior Band. And Two Beers with the Hunter, Druid, and Warlock and his Paladin Band. Strife Girl banning the Paladin, which oh. uh, if we have somewhat been calling for. Uh, in a lot of these matches people maybe not respecting the paladin as much i feel like on day three of this tournament seeing just how strong the paladin's been you have to respect the strength of that deck yeah it's definitely a deck that has the potential to 3-0 we've even seen instances where for example zixo had two counters to paladin in his lineup so then he left paladin up and ended up still getting swept 3-0 by paladin so it just shows you how incredibly powerful that deck can be yeah, it's we do. It does have the opportunity, obviously, to counter with uh, decks like Freeze Mage and, and Hunter. That you can use, but the Paladin is just so strong that it can beat those. And it's also you you do end up with a disadvantage because there is so much diversity in the archetype in the archetypes of Paladin. You can bring full mid range Paladin. You can bring the Secrets Paladin. You can bring just full face Paladin if you want. So yeah. many different ways you can go with it that make it uh, more effective in different matchups and sure. mean that your opponents have a, a harder time predict predicting what to pick into you. Yeah, but now at this stage in the tournament, that sort of uh, unpredictability of Paladin that was such a strength in the earlier stages of the tournament is sort of fading away as the players have played so many games. They've sort of revealed their decks, they talked to the other players, and they've gotten kind of more information about it. So Paladin's probably gone down in strength a little bit since they, do, they should know at this point exactly what archetype of Paladin their opponent's playing, and most of the cards in it probably. Yeah, looking at two beers, obviously, we talked a little bit about him being an open qualifier and a player, but maybe been around for a little while. Speaking to some of the other German players yesterday, uh, he's a guy who's been around for quite a while, playing with guys like Sixo and Faramir in uh, the meltdown scene in Berlin. He's been around Hearthstone for a long time, and I am sensing some parallels with one uh, young Firebat who was often talked about among the North American pros as a very strong player. I mean, I remember that this time last year, Admirable was telling everyone who would listen, I'm telling you, Firebat's yeah. going to win the World Championships. It's a foregone conclusion. Uh, and people maybe didn't take you as seriously as, as they would now. And uh, he was proved right. So maybe two beers could be the next Firebat. 
Yeah, you might be able to do it. You know, he's, unfortunately for him, the world championships are sort of already underway, so it's not this year that he can take that. But he's definitely gearing himself up in a good position going into the next year, setting his name up out there and getting into the spot where he needs to be to try and push for that maybe 2016 world championship title. Yeah, he managed to get a pair of wins over Super JJ yesterday from Complexity, a fellow German player who's very strong. He beat Pinny, was a, a player who's been around for a long time. Uh, he's not maybe had the hardest route to the finals, you would say. He's avoided a lot of the, the groups of death and maybe the, the really, really strong players he's avoided. Uh, for example, yesterday we had the group with RDU, Nairia and Gara, which was a very strong group, and uh, Strife, Crow and Zalei in the same group, that sort of thing. Uh, he's avoided a lot of maybe the stronger players in the tournament, but he's certainly up against it now against Strife, Crow. Yeah, definitely a top contender that he's going to have to be able to take down. And it's single elimination now. We're out of the group stage. So he's got one opportunity to make it happen. Yeah, talk to us a little bit about Strive Crow. I mean, he's a guy who needs no introduction, but just what kind of player, as a as a fellow professional, what kind of player do you read Strive Crow as? Strive Crow's a... Uh... He's a very interesting player. He has spots where he uh, is very strong, and then he has spots where he kind of like lays back on Hearthstone a little bit and doesn't focus too much on it. So he sort of just comes in waves, and you can see that with his tournament history. There's months where he's winning everything, and there's months where he's just kind of doing okay. But he never does bad, and that's one of the things that's crazy about him is that no matter where you place him at, he's always going to be very, very consistent. And that's even on his off months. <laughs> Yeah, he's only dropped uh, four games in total in this tournament so far. Mm -hmm. Hasn't lost a single match. Uh, I mean, he beat uh, Zalei yesterday. In his first group, he managed to overcome uh, Gara and Nagoyan as well. So he's, he's had a more difficult route. He's beaten some very top players. He's topped both of the group stages. Uh, he's going to be considered probably the favorite from this bottom half of the bracket. Yeah, I would say so. He's got to be... Uh, one of the most well-known players in the Hearthstone scene in general and definitely one of the most well-known players in this uh, tournament itself. And uh, after the World Championships, not going into that, I know personally myself, I feel like I need to prove something. So in the tournaments that I play in, I'm going extra hard. And I feel like maybe Strife Crow and some of the other pros that didn't quite make it to the World Championship are feeling that same mentality where it's like, wait a minute, I'm not in this the major tournament anymore. I really got to prove myself now. So it's going to be interesting to see uh how strong he's going to be here today yeah i mean we do have a couple of uh majors coming up still we've got dreamhack winter at the end of november which is uh another big opportunity for top players like yourself and like strife crow to to, sh to show that they can still win I mean, we saw that from uh from Kalento last year, right? He went out in the quarterfinals of the World Championships when many people thought that he could go all the way and uh, came back in a DreamHack winter with a renewed sense of focus and was able to yeah. to sweep that tournament. Yeah, th these top players, man, If as soon as they get like one loss, they really just readjust and go even harder. So I can imagine Strife Crow, and we've seen so far in this tournament, he's really focused in, he's really showing why he's a top player, and it's going to be really hard for Two Bears to beat him. But at the same time, it just makes such a great storyline for Two Bears if he is able to beat it. I'm just so excited to see these Titans clash, and I am just can't wait for the action to unfold. Now we see uh, a Warlock deck from Two Bears. We haven't seen too much Warlock in this tournament. I think it is a, a zoo, right? Because I think we saw the, yeah, yeah. the mirror yeah. match against Raven. So yeah, Two Bears bringing the, the zoo deck, which is... Not necessarily favored as a strong deck right now. As I say, it's a class that it's probably like in that fifth class spot when yep. a lot of people have been bringing four classes. Warlock is the the next one they would bring, but it just hasn't been uh, hasn't been favored. Why do you think that is? Uh, Warlock is like not the greatest against Paladin most of the time. Like the Handlock variants can struggle a lot against Aldor Peacekeeper and some of the tools that Paladin have. And then at the same time, now the Paladins are throwing in Zombie Chows. They're throwing in that early game board control cards. And uh, Warlocks tends to really struggle against that. So it might be the downfall of him here today. But luckily for him, it's not the Conquest format. So he can still lose with a weak deck and take the like, risks of having weak decks, using them as counter decks, whatever. If you lose with a weak deck, you still are not just trapped out of the series as you were with Conquest. So it's kind of refreshing to see that even if Zoo is maybe a poor choice for him, that he can still have a chance in the tournament. Yeah, it feels like the, the big uh, big um, victim of the patron nerf, the big fatality, has been uh, Handlock rather than Warrior. It's the Warrior class. The mm -hmm. Warlock class has suffered. Uh, Warrior we're seeing still in pretty much every lineup here, even some versions of the Patron Warrior, uh, which we'll maybe get to see from Sixo later on. Uh, and, you know, the Fatigue Warrior from Zalei, it's still very much alive as a class. But Warlock is the one, I mean, this is the first major post-Patron tournament, and we're just seeing from Warlock in pretty much every lineup to pretty much no Warlock. 
Yeah, Warlock is like, it's one of those decks that does all right against everything, but it really excelled against the Patron Warrior, and now that it doesn't have its greatest matchup, now it just has kind of left over a bunch of mediocre matchups, and that's not exactly what you want to have in last year's standing. You want to have decks that you can ladder against your opponent's decks as counter decks, and uh, Warlock just doesn't do that in too many matchups, especially with Patron gone. We see Two Beers as the only Warlock player left in the tournament after RDU lost with his handlock and was the only Zoo player to make it to the top eight. So we'll see if that's a choice that plays up, pays off for. I mean, as I said, this this isn't just some scrub who's coming off the street, coming from ladder uh, and decided to play in an open qualifier for the first time. This is a guy who's been around the Hearthstone scene for quite a while. He's watched friends go to the very top, go to major championship victories, guys like Sixo, and uh, he's looking to emulate their success and, and follow in their footsteps. What kind of motivation can that be for two beers? Well, I mean, it's like the dream, right? The esports dream. And uh, sometimes you feel like it's just one tournament victory away. And when you put all that pressure on that uh, one tournament, they can oftentimes push you to practice a little harder, work a little harder, but at the same time, cause a lot of stress and a lot of nerves. So it's going to be interesting to see how he balances that and uh, see how it works out for him. All right. I promise we are about ready to start this game. We apologize for the delays uh, while we've been sorting out the issues with uh, Nyria and the, and the previous quarterfinal and trying to get this one queued up for you can understand that uh, live production, not all these, always the easiest thing to do in the world, as well as running a tournament uh, alongside it and trying to broadcast it. But uh, we are just a, a minute or so away from this match. And uh, I'm just trying to look at what the first matchup is going to be uh, so we can talk about that. I think the first matchup is going to be the Hunter of Two Years against the Paladin of Strife Crow. So we're okay. going to see the the Paladin come out straight away. The very okay. this probably the strongest deck we've seen in the tournament against the Hunter. And yeah, there it is. And Ooh. we, we uh, just got the wrong picture there for uh, Two Years. We'll fix that in a second. This is the tech we saw yesterday that we talked about the Dread yeah. Scale, and it's in here for this matchup in particular. It's going to be. He's looking to try and play it on turn three against a turn three muster for battle and just completely destroy all of the 1-1 one, one tokens. And, I mean, even if that doesn't happen, the dream doesn't happen, there's going to be so many cases where Paladin just has so many one health minions or divine shield minions, and Dreadscale can pick up a lot of value off that. Yeah, it looks like it's going to be a mid-range hunter. The presence of the web spinner kind of indicates that. Uh, it'll be interesting to see if Strife Crow, I mean, you talk to a Strife Crow maybe not being the player who uh, invests the most time, in being in play, in playing the game of Hearthstone, he maybe didn't check out the stream over the past two days and wouldn't have seen this dread scale tech, because uh, I think we only saw it once from two beers, maybe on day sure. one. Sure, sure, but like even if you have seen the tech and you know it's there, can you really turn down a muster for battle? Like it's just such <laughs> a huge play, and if you don't do it, you're forgoing such a huge development most of the time because that's one of your crucial three drops in the Paladin deck. Yeah, I mean, and this is a pretty good hand here for Strife Crow. He has double two drops into Monster for Battlelord Coghammer. He's just going to go with the Secret Keeper with no secrets to follow it up. But it does demand yeah. a response, the Secret Keeper. Yeah, it definitely demands a response. It can test the web spinner on board, allows him to save the coin for maybe some trickier plays later on. He can coin a three drop if he needs immediate action on the board against something like a knife juggler. Or he can hold on to the coin and probably try and get out a rush to Mysterious Challenger or one of those bigger threats that are in the Paladin deck. Well, the second muster of battle coming to hand. Does he just want to flood the board with dudes, go ch uh, muster into muster? This could be a disaster for him. If he's a, <laughs> if he goes for the muster for battle here, it could totally backfire on him, and this dread scale could just snowball the game right here on turn three and maybe mm. make it into a swift ending right here. I, I can't say I've ever actually seen dread scale in a competitive match before Firebat. I don't know about you. Yeah, I mean, I've seen a few players play around with it, uh, we have yet to see it have the huge blowout impact yet, but it's uh, it came close here. But uh, Strife Girl going to go with the Cog Hammer instead. Yeah, and this is where we see that a lot of decks are being sort of tuned towards this Paladin. So we talk about players maybe not respecting the Paladin, but I think a lot of people maybe don't think it's completely unbeatable at this point. They're just yeah. trying to tech their decks towards it. So we see things like Flare, we see Dread Scale, we see Cone of Cold and Freeze Mage. Uh, we see Yagu doing quite well with Rogue. People are trying to find the way to, to beat the deck rather than having to ban it and take it out. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense when you expect every single person to have it then uh, if you can find a lineup that can target it effectively and just kind of cancel it out, you're going to have some great success. All right, so the cock hammer did come down last turn, which makes up for an awkward huffer here from yeah. uh, from Two Beers. Definitely not the huffer, not the creature he would have liked to see, I don't think. 
Yeah, he's debating, I guess, whether or not he wants to pop the bubble or not pop the bubble. He does have the the trap up, so he could be like holding back and maybe try and signal some sort of snake trap play. But uh, I would really like to see him go in there and pop the bubble off, as otherwise it just dies to the weapon. Yeah, I mean, this you are allowing your opponent to trade the secret keeper into the into the huffer here, but otherwise it does just die to the weapon. So, I mean, there's a freezing trap up, but. True, yeah, so he, yeah. it doesn't trade with the freezing trap, uh, unfortunately, for Strife Crow. But he can just kill it with a weapon. Mm -hmm. He's it just definitely, yeah, he's definitely going to be able to take it down with the weapon. Lucky for him enough that it was able to pop off a bubble, but oh, Huffer, not the one you want to see going into a two damage weapon. But I'm really excited about the story of this Dread Scale and seeing if he can actually do some work here, because there's just so many situations here where Strife Crow could muster for battle, and if he does, it could spell absolute disaster for him. Yeah, I mean, it must have about one three. I mean, especially into a freezing trap, it actually doesn't. It feels pretty good because then you can trigger the freezing trap with a one one, which is a really low value minion. Uh, it feels like a great option, but this dread scale. Yeah, I I feel like we may see the secret keeper come down here just for mana efficiency for strife Girl, or a muster for battle. I don't see him playing one of the two drops, and it is going to be the muster for battle. Oh my gosh, this dread scale. Yeah, I mean that's just going to be a snap dread scale, right? Oh yeah, that's the dream. This is why you put it in the deck. You, you you thought about this situation, you put it in the deck, and you're just praying and hoping it happens. Oh my. All of those dudes are just about to get roasted by their dread skill. Dread skill. Big game hunter for one ones. Oh, yeah. Absolutely disgusting. And now the cog hammer's gone, so he doesn't have the ability to remove the 4-2 as efficiency as efficiently as he would like to. He has, so he has no way to take this out this turn, right? No, so it's going to be able to proc again and start doing even more work on the board. You can even use it to pop the Haunted Creeper, so then the 1-1s of the Haunted Creeper die as well. Oh. This is, uh, this, as you say, this Dread Scale could just completely snowball this game. As long as that Dread Scale is on the board, the Muster for Bat was a dead card in Strife Crow's hand. He doesn't yeah. want to play that. Doesn't want to play it at all. It's a bit interesting there. Strife Crow didn't decide to maybe try and pop or hit the Dread Scale because the effect happens at the end of Two Beer's turn. So if he hits it with the weapon, then it can't trade into the Haunted Creeper to kill the 1 1 tokens. Do you think that's maybe a little bit of uh, inexperience with the card, not knowing how to play around Dread Scale? <laughs> yeah, I could definitely account that for oh. being the case. It is a pretty tricky card to play around. It looks like Two Beer is going to play Freezing Trap and Animal Companion here. Probably clean up the Haunted Creeper and try and just lock out this uh, shielded minibot from doing anything on the board. Rolls a second Huffer of Animal Companion here, which is, again, maybe a little bit unfortunate. He possibly would have been looking for uh, Misha to protect the Dread Scale. Sure, yeah, Misha would have definitely been better, but you still can't complain too much about the Piggy. You have so much burn locked up in your hand right now. Two beers sitting on a Kill Command and a Quick Shot, and even a Stone Toast Boar, which when you think about it with the Kill Command actually adds a significant amount of damage. Yeah, so yeah, he's gonna pop that haunted creeper. Mm -hmm. Just go to face with the huffer. That's where uh, this is where huffer belongs. That is where it belongs. Face is definitely the place for that guy. Knife juggler joins yeah, Strife Crow's hand. This might be the only time you'll see a muster for battle played with a dread skill on the boards. Yeah, <laughs> muster for battling into dread scale for a change. But with nice. the knife juggler, you can clear this board with juggles, which, which would be pretty amazing. You can proc the freezing trap as well. Mm-hmm. So he's that's two traps. Yeah, he's proccing the trap first just in case it's explosive or something so he can get that out of the way first before he commits to the board. Put this apple on your head! Yep, so here we're going to go for the Master for Battle. See if he can snipe both of these minions. Oh, he gets the Dread Scale, so that's pretty good for him. Let's see if he can get the other juggle. No, so he's going to have to take four to face here. That's something you want to do, but at the same time, you're at 15, which is still half of your life pool. Although it seems low now, it's actually not that low, and he has the full board control. You can play Mysterious Challenger next turn, I guess. I mean, we've been we talking about Dread Scale as a card that really uh, dictates this game, but I think Mysterious Challenger is one we should probably consider. <laughs> yeah, for sure, especially since it has such great offensive attributes, but such great defensive attributes at the same time. Like, it sets up that Noble Sacrifice, which sort of acts like a taunt and can slow down your opponent from doing too much damage to you. But looking at this hand from two beers, he's got two options here. Option number one try and control this board, which doesn't seem very likely with how far Strife Crow is now ahead. Or option two, SM Orc. <laughs> I wonder. Yeah, well, I mean, you are a fan of the Smork Life Firebat. What what kind of, uh, how many Smorks out of 10 would you give this play? Oh, this is a 10 out of 10 right here. This is exactly what you need to be doing. 
You really need to be setting up the race situation here. You don't have time to control this board. You can't compete with your opponent's hand size, especially when all of the cards in your hand are just simply damage. Uh, are you sure you're going to give a full 10 out of 10 if he didn't play the doesn't play the Stone Tusk board and go to face? Well, yes, you need the Stone Tusk board to possibly uh, activate the Noble Sacrifice as well as proc your Kill Command to set up for the lethal next turn through Mysterious Challenger. All right, so is he going to be able to weave in a lethal here alongside playing around all these secrets? Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's going to be able to use the Stone Tusk board, take care of the Noble Sacrifice, the Kill Command to the face, and uh, Quick Shot to the face, and the Hero Power to the face. I don't know, it doesn't have enough matter for that, but he can use Stone Tusk board and then the bow. Stone Tusk board off Web Spinner, taking the board control, and doing lots of work here. To did, you, did, you, did someone secrets. say board control? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, not, not really any board control, just more smart control, I guess. <laughs> well, two beers is going to take the first game here against Strife Crow. Uh, that's going to be a little, bit, a little bit of a nerve settler for him, I guess, going up against such a big player. You know, you half expect to just get blown away 3-0, I think, going up against such a, an established player. Getting that first win, two beers could really settle into this series here. Uh, and this could be, we could have a match on our hands here. Yeah, definitely. Getting the Paladin out of the way has got to feel good. That's a deck that's just terrifying to play against. Even when you have counters to it, sometimes the Paladin can get one of those draws that you can't even beat with the counter. So just getting that out of the way, getting that done with, Strife Crew can no longer queue it because the last year of standing format, it's got to feel good. Yep, so Strife Crew has the Hunter of his own and the Mage left. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure what Mage is that Strife Crew is playing. I think, I think it might be Temple Mage. Temple Mage, really. Strife Crow is really known for the Freeze Mage, so I would be leaning more towards Freeze Mage, but uh, I don't know if we've actually casted the Mage yet, so it's sort of a mystery still. Yeah, I think we might have missed out on that one. Yeah, definitely uh, Freeze Mage can be alright against Midrange Hunter, it's not exceptional, and then the faster Hunter usually wins between two Hunters, so if he's got a sort of aggressive Hunter, I would definitely see that coming out here, but if he's got a sort of a slower Hunter as well, like Two Beers' Midrangey Hunter, then I don't think Hunter's going to be coming out. I think he's going to have to try and bank on the Freeze Mage or Tempo Mage. All right, so we'll see what he does decide to go into here. It'll be interesting to see how the Dread Skill affects uh, a potential Hunter match as well. There's uh, th If Strife goes bringing a more aggressive variant, things like Wargans and Lepronomes, mm -hmm. Abusive Sergeants, that Dread Skill could really mess him up. It's looking more and more like a, a really interesting tech choice. Yeah, definitely could do a lot of work against a more aggressive hunter. That's really interesting to see it come out like that. Are you, uh, you going to go play with your Dreadscale Hunter after the, <laughs> I when, think, when we're done here? Yeah, I think I might have to start teching in Dreadscale. Maybe Two Beers is just ahead of the meta and knows the right text. But uh, that's not a mage or a hunter. That's a warrior. Oh, I thought we I did see the warrior was banned for Strife Corps. Maybe we got the uh, wrong information there. It was okay. actually the... Yeah, so it's actually the mage of Strife Crow that was banned, not the uh, not the warrior. So the warrior yep. is still alive, and it was in fact the druid of Two Beers that was banned and not the paladin. So Two Beers does still have his paladin available. All right, so Two Beers, he has some interesting tech here as well. He's got the Harrison Jones teched in, maybe foreseeing the possibility of warrior being queued up to try and counter his hunter. So he throws in that Harrison Jones in there to try and burn him. Yeah, I mean, we're seeing tech cards coming into the hands here uh, for both players. For, for two beers, sorry, uh, against both ma in both matchups, picking mm -hmm. up the tech card in his opening hand. I don't know if he kept that. He possibly kept the Harrison Jones there off the mulligan. Oh, what yeah. do you think about that? Yeah, for sure. I mean, Warrior's going to try and play weapons to stop your damage. Harrison Jones is a solid five drop, and it just removes those weapons. So it just directly interrupts the game plan that the Warrior's trying to have against you. Yeah, we're just going to see coined out Armorsmith here from Strife Crow. This is a play we kind of talked about yesterday is... Uh, whether or not you should coin out the armor smith on two when there's no no threat and you don't want to play your fire war axe early would you not maybe save the coin for for later for later turns i could definitely see saving it for later trying to get one of these two six drops out of your hand but at the same time getting that armor smith down on the field allows you to develop the fire war axe cleanly it's just you have two two drops because you can consider the fire war axe as a two drop it's very fine and reasonable to try and get them both out there helps you interact with traps and such a little bit better as well Yep, does play the fire works and yeah, we're gonna go ahead and kill the mad scientist and 
I assume we'll be freezing trap here because we see a snake in the hand and mm -hmm. we saw two freezing in the last game, so I would assume it's just two freezing, one snake for two beers. Yeah, no more techie cards, I guess. I mean, no, you no, gotta no run snake. out of time. Yeah. How many tech slots can you have? You already got Harrison Jones and the other guy in there. But Misha comes out. It's pretty fortunate for him. Misha on turn three is pretty difficult for a warrior to deal with most of the time. Yeah, I mean, even with uh, an armor smith up or something, you might have been able to do something with uh, armor smith, with shield slam, but doesn't have that available. Even bash just does three damage, so no way to clear this Misha here. We'll, I assume we either just see an armor up and pass, or the armor smith come down. Uh, I don't mind actually seeing just like the bash and swing either. Like if you want to play super defensively around something like Houndmaster, it seems pretty reasonable. But uh, it just depends on how much of a risk you want to take because Bash is such an incredible Maybe. resource and having to sink the second charge of the War Axe and Bash into one minion is really costly. So Strife Girl is going to take a bit of a risk here around Houndmaster and just uh, let the bear live. Uh, look at that damage in Two Bear's hand. Wow. <laughs> that's a lot. That's two kill commands and a quick shot. Yeah, I mean, that's not what you want to see this early on in the game. You really want to be developing your board. But uh, if he's able to keep having these minions stick like this Misha's been mm -hmm. sticking, that damage can soon reach that critical level that's required to end the game. Yeah, we could just see a, uh, a snake trap and a hero power here just to develop the boards. Mm -hmm. Keep pressing that hero power to answer the warrior hero power, especially with the armor smith on board. They're... The armor smith will give him an answer to Misha this turn for Strife Crow, but he will either have to take four to face with the war axe or use his bash. Um, I think we might see the bash is the answer here, just because he doesn't necessarily have a better option in his hand other than a, a four mana armor smith. Interesting, he chooses to use the kill command here. I would have liked to see the snakes come out there, as most of the time the warrior is going to be using their face to kind of deal with the bear, and you could have got some early snakes out, which can really actually be difficult for the warrior to deal with is like traditionally they can struggle against paladin because they don't have too many whirlwind effects in their deck unless they're running the patron variant okay well we do see now the ability to remove misha from the board in the strife core hand but none of them are particularly great value Maybe. options you can mm -hmm. use the axe and execute or bash you can use armor up shield slam and execute but it's a lot of resources into a misha yeah exactly i, I think he's gonna stick with the same sort of train of thinking his last turn and play the Armorsmith again. He saw that there was no Houndmaster. Now the, the threat is like Ram Wrangler, potentially. You don't have any turn five play, so like next turn you can still spend all of your mana just removing if you need to. So I think we're either going to see like an Armor Pass or the uh, Armorsmith come down. Just staying consistent with his previous line. Yep, just going to play that four mana Armorsmith. Mm -hmm. Very passive turn. And this is going to be the Harrison Jones turn. This is a pretty big tempo swing. We see some emote BM coming out. Ooh, so painful. Misha's been living for so long, putting in so much chip damage. And Harrison Jones joins the field, making it even harder for Strife Crow to start removing these minions. Yeah, that, that, that's going to feel pretty good for two beers, because that Fire War Axe has stuck around for, what, three, four turns since turn mm -hmm. two? And uh, yeah. when that came out, he probably wasn't thinking that that would still be around on turn five for Harrison Jones. Yeah, exactly. I think that was uh, sort of the justification behind the kill command line. He wanted to kill command the Armorsmith so that uh, Strife Crow couldn't use the Armorsmith and the War Axe to deal with the Misha, so that he would just kind of, even though he like neglects his own snake trap value, he's just uh, sort of ensuring the Harrison Jones value. Pretty interesting line. And again, we see this four health uh, on both creatures is really difficult for Strife Crow to deal with here. Yeah, he's definitely praying and wishing he had a Despite right now, because that would make things way easier. <laughs> yeah, this is the thing. Warriors have su uh, such a great option in their deck to deal 4 damage and remove 4 health creatures, yeah. but Strefko has just sadly not drawn it. Mm -hmm. So he's so... got to resort to other options. It looks like he's going to use the Bash and the Shield Slam maybe to clear off both minions, but he has to sacrifice his second Armor Smith, and he's not developing anything, and it's going into the Hunter's turn 6, and... We know there's no high main, but traditionally, this is where the high main comes down and ruins the Warrior's Day. Well, there's a knife jug on a Mad Scientist, and of course he can hit that hero power button once again, so he can develop a couple of minions here. Um, yeah. I would like to see, I'd like to see the Snake Trap really come out, especially with the Knife Juggler on field. Like, you got to be expecting Strife Crow is going to be drawing into another weapon Are soon, and he's going to want to be weaponing down that Knife Juggler, and if you got that Snake Trap up... Making three snakes, dealing three extra damage with them is extremely powerful. I'll show them. 
Yeah, it looks like he's gonna play the snakes over the hero power this turn. Mm -hmm. So there'll be yeah. just the one freezing for the mad scientist to pull, we assume. Second War X is a pretty good pickup, allows him to clean up this board for Strife Crow. But again, Strife Crow's gonna have to be very passive if he wants to clear up this board. Yeah, he's gonna say that the knife juggler is too much of a threat and he's gonna slam it and get it out of the way. He's gonna assume that a freezing trap's up, so he doesn't want to develop a six drop into a freezing trap. And he's gonna have to fall for the snakes here. And he's not gonna be happy about that. No, the Strife go really up against it here. The Hunter play from two years with a, a not exactly favorable hand here. Mm -hmm. Drawing he's... into his damage really quickly, uh, far more quickly than he would want to. He's playing this hand very well. Yeah, he really needs some sort of minion that has any sort of value because he's really just run out of steam here. All he has left is the damage finisher cards, and he's had none of the mid-game support or the late-game support features that really bring this uh, bring this home. Yeah, this is the point where the Hunter he, he's, might just go for the kill command into the face here. I'm not sure yeah. why this is against Warrior. It's a play you would not you would normally make against a class which that you don't expect to have life gain, um, especially from something like an Alex Straza. Yeah, well, I mean, he needs to get his hand empty. He needs to start cycling this quick shot and get towards more cards that do things because he's way out of gas now and he's got a very limited window where he can finish this game before the warrior starts being able to play all of his big bombs and really catch back up on the field. All right, what's he drawn this turn? Gets a King's Elec. If that you can draw into a high main here. Yeah. Oh, oh gets, doesn't get the card draw. <laughs> He goes for the guard draw off the beast, so he can use some of his mana. He gets a weak minion. Not well, really. What that's he's actually not for. bad though, because the Timberwolf means that he can then clear off the five four with the snakes. Oh, he's not trading, is he? <laughs> I think at this point you've gotten your opponent so low that you don't mind if they heal for five. I don't know. I think I think he probably will go for the trade just because he has so few options in his own hand. But he disagrees with me. He's going the, going for the face. I mean, when you have so few options, that's when you need to go face, because otherwise you're going to get outvalued by your opponent having too many options. But uh, there is a Freezing Trap up, so he can replay the Shield Maiden if he wants, but if he's replaying the Shield Maiden, he's going to be taking so much more damage on the backswing of that, so I feel like Strife Crow's pressured into a situation where he needs to be using things like maybe Bash to clear, but without a minion to develop behind it, it gets a little awkward. Yeah, I mean, Bash on the Timberwolf, I guess, <laughs> takes the most power off the board. Yeah, that doesn't cool. feel good. Yeah, it definitely does not feel like a strong play. So maybe it is a... Uh, maybe he does have to replay the Maiden. But then on the backswing of that, there's 6, 7, 8, 9. 9 power on the board directly. 10, 11 with the hero power. 3 more from the quick shot. Going up to 14 damage potentially coming in this turn. So if he does go with the Sylvanas armor up, which is the risky play to try and get forward back, then uh, he would die. I can take the hit. But he's going to go with the Maiden, so that puts him uh, 3 health out of range. Another Elec. Let's see if we can uh, draw the high main this time. No, no. High main. Whips on it again. I mean, it's really hard to beat Control Warrior in some Jousts. They got, yes. a, they got some pretty good tools for Jousts, so it looks like he's just going to try and set his opponent down to 1 health here. Possibly hit another Quick Shot off the top for Lethal. No Quick Shot, but Dr. Boom's no slack. So he's going to make the trade here and clear that off. Which I, I don't mind when you've got Dr. Boom as the follow-up. Sure, yeah. If you had only, like, if you didn't have, like, a big creature to follow it up, I like kind of going all in more. But with the follow-up of Dr. Boom makes a lot of sense. And you do also need to trade at least one. So uh, if he, if your opponent doesn't kill any of your minions, you can play the Boom bots. But you do it anyway if he doesn't kill any of your minions. Yeah, they're probably dead if all of this stays. <laughs> <laughs> well, you don't want to, you don't want to risk having to play a vanilla 7-7 seven, seven for 7. So many choices. That's what you don't want. Yeah, and Two Beers has positioned himself here that he has 15 damage on the board, 13 on the board, I mean, and 2 with the hero power. So if uh, Strife Crow does Alex Draza, Strife Crow is exactly dead to the board. So he needs something better than Alex Draza here. And it, as it turns out, all he's got is Alex Draza. Doesn't have anything quite better. Well, does that remove more power, actually? That removes 4, 5 power, and heals 3 health. So that's like a heal for 8. And then he has the armor, so goes up to 11, and he's still facing down 3, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So he's actually 1 damage off lethal here for 2 beers. Let's see what he can top deck. It does finally get that high mate he was looking for a few turns ago. Yeah, it's a little late. If Strife Crow can stabilize here, 
I, how does he stabilize? Like, he's going to need some sort of crazy brawl play, I guess. He's definitely going to need to find some card like Shield Block, some sort of burst healing card that can give him a moment of breathing room so that then he can establish how it's driving. Having these two big minions to follow up is uh, is really great for two beers because it kind of denies the Alexstrasza play. Mm -hmm. If there were just these small minions on board, then Strifeco could probably afford to to go with the Alexstrasza, but he pretty much just dies anyway if he plays Alex. He's able to find this shield block here. Two beers chose to develop the high main over the Doctor Boom just because the high main's a lot more resilient to things like brawl and execute and whatnot because it comes back to life as two two twos, which is more than enough pressure to end the game. I don't know, if, if you play Dr. Boom and then he brawls on an empty board, you got a pretty good chance to kill him. Yeah, sure, sure. But it's not as good as having board control, I don't think, because if they're able to like do something like shield block and then brawl and then a boom bot lives, that's very sad. But if they shield block and then brawl and your elephant, the 3-2 lives, and then the 2-2 spawn on top of that, you still have a significant board presence that uh, Stripe would be facing down. Yeah. So I definitely like the high main a lot better. <laughs> We just can see an execute on the 3-1 and then Alex. Yeah. So that's going to take him up to 15 and uh, his opponent. Two damage has, off. Yeah. Two damage. Just looking for one more burn card. Doesn't quite find it, but. He drew you know, all his burn main. ages ago and now he's just, and he did, couldn't draw his high mains on six and now he's drawing his high mains back to back. Yeah, I mean, it's not a bad time to get him still. Definitely still, still pretty solid on the board here. Is he going to commit the second one, or is he worried about some sort of brawl or something? I would like to see him commit the second one, because Alex can pop the first high main and then brawl and cause some shenanigans. Okay. Yeah, so it's double it's high main, it's pretty hard to see how Strife can get out of this. Does have double shield block, mm -hmm. so it can go up to 12, 14, but that's not going to be enough. Doesn't get yeah. the brawl that he needed there. He's looking what could possibly get him out of this. Yes, Sarah's definitely not it. Uh, how much damage? 12? Yeah, there's... He's there's way no way. Yeah, yeah, even if he trades into, like, 3-2. Oh, because actually trading into high main only removes 2 damage from the board because the death rate only the spawn afterwards. All right, well, Strife go 2-0 down here against 2 beers. Two Beers is one game away from taking out Strife Crow and advancing to our semifinals. We could have a real story in our hands here, Firebat. Yeah, definitely. I'm really excited to see this Hunter deck doing well. He's got a lot of text in there that not many of the other players have been seeing. We have not seen any Dread Skill besides Two Beers, and we have not seen any Harrison Jones and Hunter besides Two Beers, and we see them both pull massive weight here, doing exactly what they need to do in probably the matchups he was expecting. All right, and a Hunter Mirror from Strife Core, obviously that's uh, the only deck he has left. Mm -hmm. It does look like a more aggressive version than Two Beers yeah. is running with things like Lepernome, but we talked about how it, if this is aggressive with the abuse of sergeants, Lepernomes, even things like Worgen Infiltrator, that could be really bad against Dread Scale. Sure, it could definitely be bad against Dread Scale, but oftentimes I think those little two, uh, one drops and such are going to be able to get their damage in before Dread Scale can come down and maybe be a bit too fast for him. So it's going to be interesting to see the timing on how all that plays out. But, uh,. I think, actually, if Strife Crow had known that Two Beers had Harrison Jones in his mid-range hunter, he may have actually opted to queue this deck first. But uh, I think he was unaware of that tech choice, and it really punished him not knowing that. Yeah, does have a good curve here, Strife Crow. Can obviously go with a Lapronome into one of three two-drops. Mm -hmm. Or I can go double two-drop. Yeah, double two-drop is usually the way to do it. You want to be getting your Glaive Zooka down on two most of the time in this matchup. So I think I would like to see Strife Crow open up with maybe Haunted Creeper here. It's like the most resilient minion can trade into anything and just give you that early game board presence that you really want in these uh, sort of aggressive, but at the same time, like scrappy matchups where you're constantly trading. But I can understand scientists too, thinning out your deck, getting the trap out as soon as possible. Yep, so going with the scientist is going to pull one of five, one of the traps from Strife Crow's deck. Obviously, we have no idea what those traps could be. Uh, could be explosive, could be snakes, could be freezing. Depends if it's a, a hybrid or a, a full-on face hunter. But I would I would expect more of a hybrid build from Strife Crow. I, d I don't know how you feel, Firebat. Yeah, Strife Crow plays a lot of hybrid hunter. It's definitely one of his favorite decks. We saw an explosive trap off the mulligan, though. So we know there's at least one explosive in the deck. We see a tracking here. Ooh, that's an interesting card to see. You don't see that every day in Hunter. So, Yeah, I just wants to, I guess, dig deeper in the deck... Uh, Maybe he, took a, maybe he was playing around with Flare for a while and liked the card draw, but didn't actually get that much use off the Flare itself, so decided to go for the tracking. Who knows? 
Yeah, maybe. Or maybe he's putting it in there because he has flair in there and he wants to skip over some dead cards. It's like sort through tech cards sort of thing, you know? All right, King's Elec. Uh, I think Animal Companion has to be the strongest play on the board here. Not too many other things do very much for him. Yeah, goes for the Animal Companion and gets a Leoc, which isn't great, but the 2-4 body does allow him to control the board a little bit. It's a little bit resilient. Sure, sure. And with the Houndmaster, that guy gets up to a 6 health taunt, and that's not too bad. Uh, from Strifegrow's perspective, Strifegrow's Animal Companion role. Mm, going second uh, here for Strifegrow could be really costly for him, if there wasn't that trap there, I guess, because... Getting the Houndmaster down first on the Animal Companion, allowing it to trade into all the forms of the other Animal Companion, can be really brutal. But it looks like he's going to take the more aggressive stance here for Go the Animal Companion to develop two things with the Glaivesuka and the Lepernum. Just thinking a lot about this play, but I, I do like the aggressive line because you know that, you know, you've seen the control options from uh, Two Beers deck. You know that you are playing against a very, very mid-range deck. So you want to be aggressive and get that head start. Mm -hmm. Maybe he's thinking about killing the Leoc, I don't know. Yeah, it looks like he is kind of thinking about killing the Leoc. Maybe he's going to go face with the Haunted Creeper here, because he may have Explosive Trap up. Not sure what the trap is yet, but going face would definitely signal some sort of Explosive Trap play happening. Or maybe even like a Bear Trap bait. <laughs> At the very last second, Strife Girl goes with the attack. So as you say, yeah. it does uh, potentially bait the, uh, indicate the Explosive. Mm -hmm. We'll see. It probably is, unless it is Bear Trap. And we see this Dread Scale coming down to do massive work, like you were saying. Wow, look at that. There you go. Three one, three one health creatures killed. Dread mm -hmm. Scale looking like a pretty great option for two beers. Yeah, definitely worked out in his favor for the matchups he was trying to get with it. Uh, Strife Grow. How do you deal with this dread skill? All of your charging minions are just gonna have one health and die to it, so it's gotta be a problem. It's a problem that has to kind of go away. Plus, it's a beast, right? So it activates that Houndmaster. We don't get to see the tracking, huh? No, unfortunately not. This is awkward. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. You go Clearly, the best card there. Yeah, that was the best choice. Yeah. We assume. I mean, Strife Girl wouldn't make a wrong choice, would he? Well, he's 2-0 down. I mean, he's under pressure. The dread, the dread Skill does die. So that's right. that's going to feel good. Yeah, the Dread Skill goes down. Obviously, that's something that sort of has to happen. Explosive Trap is up, so we were right on our predictions there. And uh, now from two beers, the momentum sort of shifting back towards in Strife Girl's favor. What do you do I here? Wonder. I mean, the Houndmaster is a vanilla 4-3 is not a great option at all. Yeah, no, I like, definitely. I guess, to try, and, to try and draw one of your big threats, try and draw into Savannah High Main for 6. I, I like the Elec just because all the other cards in your hand are too important, right? You want to be able to connect Houndmaster on a minion to provide a taunt because you're, getting, you're facing Rushdown Hunter. They're definitely trying to kill you. So having a taunt is really essential. And then Knife Juggler Unleash with the Hunter's Mark even is such a great tempo swing combo that you can sort of wait until the opportune moment to unleash, if you will. Oh, really? <laughs> uh, yeah, so he's taking a bit of a slow turn here to sort of preserve his key cards that he needs for bigger combo turns later. Meanwhile, Strife Crow's side, another animal companion drawn, the perfect minion to play here. To deal more and more damage to his opponent. Two beers already down to 15 health, and Strifegrow is just sitting on three burn cards in his hand. Yeah, this is looking pretty good here. This is the the benefit of the aggressive hunter, and the midrange hunter does sometimes whiff and isn't able to take back the board. And when you combine the board control and the burn, that's a lot for your opponent to go through. Yeah, we have a little bit of a switch here back. The Houndmaster is able to land, allowing some favorable trades in the quick shot. Perfect removal to deal with that huffer. Now the tables have sort of flipped a little bit. But is it, is it enough? Is it enough fast enough? Because that hero power every turn from Strife Girl is going to be whittling away at Two Beer's life. Strife Girl can clear the board here, but that would be a, a real change in tempo from him. He'd have to, have to unleash and kill command to clear this board. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a lot of burn that he needs to finish the game. 
it would be a significant loss of tempo. We just reset the board and allow two beers to potentially play something like a high main or Doctor Boom, which Strifecrow doesn't necessarily have answers to. Yeah, yeah it looks like Strifecrow is just like kind of counting his damage, figuring out how much he needs to push. But uh, I kind of would have liked to see him wait here on this explosive trap. Because I guess he's a little scared of potentially Flare or the second Houndmaster. But letting the explosive trap do some work there could have been fairly strong. But uh, Strifecrow's clock is set up for the next two turns. He can initiate the bow next turn and then have lethal on the following turn. Yep, does have the dog to activate the kill command when he wants to do that. Yeah, so now it's all going to come down to is that clock fast enough? Does Strifecrow have two turns to live? before two bears switch, flips the switch and actually kills him. And, Let's see where uh, this juggle lands. Not too... doesn't make too much of a difference there, but two bears clears the boards. Yeah. And it's all about what Strife Crow draws here, if he can accelerate this clock any further, I think. Yeah, he's going to need something like... What could possibly even accelerate this clock? I don't... I don't think there's a card. Like, not even Stone Tusk Boar, which adds three damage for one mana. It's good enough. So, I don't know if he can actually accelerate the clock. And he might need some sort of utility card like Unleash the Hounds, sort of clean up a little bit to help him get that one extra turn. But uh, yep. Two Beers debating whether or not he wants to use the Freezing Trap here to sort of preserve his board state, or if he wants to Hero Power to set up for more eventualities for Lethal on the next turn. And he counts it out and realizes, well, I probably won't top deck Lethal if I Hero Power, so I better just Freezing Trap and try and gain in myself an extra turn on my clock. But. Life shows are really a whiff for Strife Crow here. It doesn't do anything for him. Do you think he just has to develop the bow and hero power and smash in the face and yep. cl close his eyes and pray? Yeah, it's the, the situation where you just got to hope. I hope my clock is good enough. And we know, looking at Two Bear's hand, that it probably is because Two Bear didn't hero power last turn, so he doesn't set up himself in a situation where kill command is going to allow lethal. So Unless I don't think there's Harrison. a draw. Oh. <laughs> That's only 15 because he didn't hero power last turn. He didn't set up for the eventuality of this, uh, this top deck. He was more concerned about uh, Strife Crow's possibility of chargers and uh, figured he could buy himself an extra turn. But Strife Crow has the bow, which is not stopped by Freezing Trap. So the Freezing Trap play does not buy two beers an extra turn. And Strife Crow's clock is going to be good enough to finish this game out. That's unfortunate. You can definitely see the, the merit in the Freezing Trap play mm -hmm. because it does stall that out, but uh, he is going to be punished, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, the top deck from two beers, not good enough here to finish out the game because he doesn't have anything else in hand, like a quick shot or a second kill command. Yeah. Yeah, uh, he could probably... He's probably thinking that he has to play the piloted shredder and quick shot his own piloted shredder to try and get uh, either a taunt or a heal to try and survive. Would any, but uh, Striper is sitting on the kill command, so none of those are going to be able to do it for him. But it is a, a valiant effort. Yeah, I mean, he's, he's playing all of his outs if he does kill Commander Pilot and Shredder. And, uh, you know, you got you got to play all your outs and see what happens. Yeah, exactly. Good heads up play by two beers. Showing that he's really focused and uh, paying attention, not just quitting when he's behind and seems like there's no hope. He just analyzes all the cards in his hands and tries to make any desperation play possible. All right, so Strife is going to have to keep going with this Hunter. I do feel like this is uh, a bit of a vulnerable position for Strife because it's a deck which it definitely can go wrong. Uh, and the matchups that he has against the, the Zoo and the Paladin are not necessarily amazing. Really? I think Zoo and Paladin are... Zoo and Paladin struggle a lot against Face Hunter, especially Face Hunter with explosive traps. So I think actually Strife Crow could wiggle his way back into the series. I don't think it's nearly close to over yet. Oh, we see the flare too. <laughs> oh man, okay. We didn't see the flare. We see flare and tracking in the deck of Strife Crow. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's really interesting. Yeah. I guess he's maybe when playing with the aggressive hunter deck, as you say, he plays a lot of aggressive hunter. Maybe one of his big pro big problems with it is the lack of cycle, and that's yeah. why the tracking comes in as well as the flare to allow you to draw into more consistent options. I think the paladin's a good match for the hunter. I'm not necessarily as convinced the the zoo is a blowout match. I think the zoo can. Uh, do things into the later game with the, the Void Callers and make value happen, but we will see if that comes into our fifth game. Sure, sure. We we'll, we got this to tackle in front of us first. And uh, Face Hunter, usually pretty strong against Secrets Paladin, especially when they have Flare. It's going to be interesting to see if he wants to keep the Flare now or wait 
uh, or try and like draw into it later, and he is going to keep it now. I think that's heavily because he has the Haunted Creeper here, so he has plays lined up for turns. But I don't think you can keep Flare actually if you don't have any plays going on, because it's just so much more important to have initiative on the board rather than have an answer to Mysterious Challenger X amount of turns down the line. <laughs> All right, decent curve for Strife Go here. One drop into two drop into three drop. It's uh, about as good as it gets. Yeah, definitely a solid curve, no doubt about it. Possibly see the owl come down here, just to to deal with that mini bot efficiently, maintain tempo on the board. Alternative place, he could even just uh, coin out the animal companion. It's gonna be sad if it's uh, if it's tougher though. <laughs> if you play the owl, do you trade with the mini bot or do you just? Keep going face and then make sure the minibot doesn't get a two for one. Uh, yeah, you just owl it and then uh, go face. So, because either way, like the trade would happen. For duty. But a muster for battle comes down and he rolls Huffer, so the board's gonna get cleaned up really quickly here. And the paladin's gonna start having initiative, but at the cost of 10 life already. Ooh. Yeah, the paladin already very low, and the hunter has quite a bit of burn already with the kill command and the eagle horn bow. Mm -hmm. and yeah. the flare to deal with any secrets. Uh, this isn't a great turn three. I guess he can Eagle Horn and kill the 2-2, but he's allowing the Paladin to develop a board. Yeah, Eagle Horn right to space. space. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, the, that's the play. He's got 11 damage in hand if you count the two charges of the Eagle Horn bow plus the kill command, which means he just needs to weave in four hero powers with that, and then he has enough damage to end the game, and that's assuming he doesn't draw any more damage. So I really like Strife Crow's uh, line there of just a swing in face. Well, you, you are Professor Smork, you would know. If, yeah. When it comes to going face, Firebat is the arbiter, and if, uh, if Firebat says go face, I'm not going to disagree. Mm -hmm. That Here, PhD though... from the, the London School of Smorkonomics. Ooh, I like this by Strife Crow. Using the flare preemptively just to cycle, just to find an answer here. Pulls up the quick shot, which he can then use to try and clear out that knife juggler if he wants, or he can go face with it. He's clocked right now, he's got six damage next turn potentially, with his max burst. So he needs two turns, and then he can win the game. So he can Glaive Zuka hero power this turn, and then follow it up with like kill command quick shot, and uh, Glaive Zuka again to do 12 total damage. He just needs, so he's got a two turn clock set up. But uh, how the Paladin's clock might even be a little faster. Yeah, I was just going to say, with the Lothab coming down, I think the damage coming on the backswing yeah. might be a problem here. Yeah, Strife Crow's got no way to deal with this. The Lothab sort of seals him out of any sort of unleash play to try and clean it up, and that's going to be a swift victory for the Paladin outracing the face hunter's clock. Wow, that's a, a very quick victory. Five-turn victory for the Paladin. You can see what that means to two beers, <laughs> taking yeah. out Strife Crow. He is absolutely elated to get that win. Uh, mm -hmm. Jumping up and running around out of his chair. Yeah, oh, definitely. Man. You gotta feel good for him getting that huge win. Yeah, it, it definitely looked awesome. Definitely well played from both sides, and he's the uh, the last saving grace of the open qualifiers. Great to see him do well. Sad to see Strife Crow go though, as he's a fan favorite and one of the top contenders for a player that could win this tournament. And now that Two Beers has taken him out, does that make Two Beers the top contender to win? Well, I mean, I mean you gotta think a little bit. It's. Uh... <laughs> Two, two beers, when you take out a player like Strife Crow, you can't be afraid of anyone at that point, right? I mean, he's yeah. in the money, he's in the top four, he's only two wins away now, so he'll play Eloise in the semi-final, uh, and then yeah. the winner of Zolay and Sixo, but all of those players, will, you know, be, you could say they're on the level with Strife Crow, so if I can beat Strife Crow, who, can I, who can't I be? Yeah, and he, he beat Strife Crow in a pretty uh, convincing manner, too. It wasn't some sort of, like, he got lucky and RNG'd his way in there. He had tech cards in his deck that hit, and uh seemed like he had a plan going into it for this sort of lineup, and it worked out very well, so. Yeah, but this is the power of open qualifiers, is that sometimes, you know, some of the, a lot of those players did drop in the first group stage, and as we get to the top eight, we're only left with one of the eight that we started with, but one of them has made it all the way to the top four. Uh, what a breakout performance for two beers. Almost at this point, it doesn't really matter how much further he goes. He took out Strife Crow. He's made it into the money. This is already a breakout performance for him. Sure, but he would definitely like to get first. I don't think he wants to stop here. <laughs> oh, yeah. You don't, you don't enter a tournament not wanting to get first. Uh, don't yeah. blame him for that whatsoever. But, uh, yeah, that's got to feel good for him, and, and it shows the, the virtue of the open qualifier as well. We're going to go to a quick break, and then we'll come back to uh, make up a guess for not seeing Eloise in our quarterfinal, we're actually going to bring you a uh, special show match with some special fun decks, I believe, Eloise has prepared against one of her opponents from the first day and a, a Twitch chat favorite, Show. 
So we're going to see a rematch between Eloise and Sho, uh, and they're going to play some fun decks for us to fill some time before we hit to our semifinals. So we're going to be back in just a few minutes with that. Don't go anywhere. You're watching the HS Arena Invitational. <laughs> 